In the previous video I did on zero axis, I described what it does and I started to go into what happens on installation. What I'll do in this video is I'll talk more about how zero axis installs and really how it tries to stay resilient on a particular system. So when zero axis installs, it basically checks, first of all, whether you're running either a 32-bit or 64-bit windows. Okay, and it, it does this using an API known as the uh, ZW Query Information Process, Query Information Process API. Okay, and this API basically will can be used to determine what version of Windows is running, and then once Zero Access knows what version is running, you can then choose the appropriate installation mechanism. Now, I do want to point out one thing is that, uh, you know, in the past, really, 32-bit version and 64-bit versions have been different. Uh, they're actually starting to look more and more similar with more recent versions of Zero Access. And in particular, the real differences are around the 32-bit version historically used to do a lot of stuff in kernel mode. Uh, in fact, it had a kernel mode rootkit in it. Whereas the 64-bit the version focused uh, and primarily ran within uh, user space memory. And now we're starting to see a shift away from that where the 32-bit version is starting to run more and more in user mode as well. And really the difference between the 32-bit and 64-bit versions has been decreasing over time. Okay, So what I'll try to do is, is in this video I'll, I'll meld some of these different flavors together and I'll try to draw some of the distinctions out so you have a feeling for where things are different. Now, Zero Access does try to hide its presence on a system and it's used varying techniques in this regard and I think the Approaches have even historically varied depending upon whether the 32-bit or 64-bit versions are being used. Now, at one point, Zero Access used, essentially, as I mentioned earlier, it used a, a kernel mode, let me put that in green, a kernel mode rootkit to stay on the system. And this is um, a kernel mode rootkits. I've done some videos on rootkits, and you might want to check those out. But effectively, uh, what the Zero Access Trojan did is it really tried to it would basically take an existing kernel mode driver and it would create a copy of that kernel mode driver and then it would overwrite the original driver and have its own code loaded into kernel space. And then it used kernel mode hooks so that anybody who was, or anybody else really, who was trying to examine the original driver would get that legitimate one instead. Now, Zero Access has moved away from this type of approach to one that does not involve any kernel mode manipulation, especially more recently. Uh, in the past, Zero Access has also used uh, approaches like trying to create hidden volumes on the file system. Okay, and that's another uh, technique it's used to maintain its own resilience. And in this regard, what it did is it would store its files in this hidden volume, and then it uh, would be difficult for any reasonable user to find that hidden volume. Now, Zero Access has also simply just created a legitimate looking Windows directory, and it's stored encrypted files there. And in fact, one thing it does is it makes that directory harder to access through modifying the access control privileges of that directory using things like symbolic links. Now because of the way it's set up, you can't really access the zero access files using any kind of standard Windows APIs. And so what zero access had to do was directly read and decrypt files without using the Windows API. And again, this is more for older versions of, of zero access. <clears throat> now interestingly, it does seem like the zero access Trojan is adopting simpler and simpler techniques over time. Uh, rather than becoming more and more complicated. And I think that that shift is, is interesting because you don't normally see uh, malware doing simpler things. And, and the reason for that is that uh, you know malware authors tend to evolve their techniques over time. And what we're actually seeing is the opposite. They're, we're seeing malware authors do now simpler things over time with respect to zero access. Uh, and that, that again, that is not, not such a common thing. And I think the reason for that is that the authors of Zero Access are discovering that you don't really need to be clever to be effective. And that clever techniques, you know, they do come at a price. And the reality is that uh, you, you, know, you might end up hindering system performance or stability. Maybe these clever techniques don't often work correctly. They may lead to uh, increased detection or increased observation. Or they may even lead to the possibility that the Trojan will just fail to work altogether. And also, I do want to point out that it is easier to maintain a single code base. So if everything runs in user space and if they have... Uh, both the 32-bit and 64-bit versions running in, in a similar fashion, there's less code to maintain, and that's a good thing from the malware author's perspective. Okay? Now, on earlier 64-bit versions, the files that uh, 
that Zero Access created. They were actually stored within what's known as the, the Global Assembly Cache. I'm going to point that here. For the 64-bit version, they used to store the files in what's called a Global Assembly Cache. And the Global Assembly Cache, that's basically just a repository. It's a repository of .NET related files that Windows uses. And this cache is in particular not easily viewable by your average user under a typical configuration, although it effectively does exist you know, in, in plain sight, if you will, on the file system. Now, as I mentioned before, in more recent versions of Zero Access, there has been a shift towards minimizing the differences between the 32-bit and 64-bit versions. In that regard, there is no more kernel-specific component in Zero Access. And what is basically happening nowadays is that during execution, the zero access basically will, will take its DLL and it's going to basically inject its DLL into uh, common Windows services like uh, explorer.exe or services.exe. Okay, so these are common Windows components and by injecting itself into these common Windows components, it can disguise itself and run as if it's in the context of those components. And then to maintain persistence across multiple reboots, basically what will happen is, is Zero Access modifies the Windows registry into some COM object manipulation to achieve that. Okay. Now, I also do want to point out that to achieve more resilience, to really make it more difficult to detect, uh, one of the first things that Zero Access does is it actually disables. It disables Windows services, and it specifically focuses on services that are uh, security-related. Uh, so, for example, uh, that would include things like the uh, the Windows Firewall or the uh, the Windows uh, Security Center, okay, and also uh, Windows Defender as well. And this this approach of disabling security services is common among a lot of malware. And a lot of malware does this to remain resilient, if you will. Okay. Now, in some versions, Zero Access has used an interesting scheme. It's actually like a honeypot like scheme, and maybe for, for lack of a better term, um, I'll, I'll, call it, uh, I'll call it a honey process, and let me find a place to write that down. So basically, Zero Access uses something called the honey process, uh, and this is something that's unique. I haven't actually seen this type of technique being used before, and I'll describe what a honey process does. But basically, what it does is it, is it basically is a special process that Zero Access creates, and then it monitors. And what Zero Access then attempts to do is it attempts to terminate any other process that tries to examine this special honey process. Okay? So it's like a trap, it's a red herring. And the idea being that aside from security software, no other type of software has any real reason to monitor this particular honey process or to try to observe its, its actions. Now, I think this particular technique, it is very aggressive and it's also very conspicuous and, and as a result, quite noisy. And so I think it, it, as a result of all that, it can be or rather, it maybe makes zero access much more easy to detect. And when it's easy to detect the presence of a particular threat, that means the technique is not quite as viable as maybe the authors might have thought. And I think that's perhaps why this particular technique has been dropped in future versions. But I wanted to point it out because it is a relatively new technique. I haven't seen uh, this type of thing being done before. Okay, I will stop this video right here. And in the next video, I'll talk a bit more about zero access and focus more on how it uses peer-to-peer uh, -peer approaches to spread and to uh, copy malicious payloads.